Welcome to the Invincible Innovation Show, the podcast for changemakers. Each week, I talk to the most fascinating entrepreneurs and innovation leaders about innovation, strategy, and design. Hey, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about the leader's path to change, and I'm very, very excited about our guest, and I want to say that I'm excited because it's my 60th episode 60 it's like yeah i'm so happy with it so i want to welcome you to this invincible innovation live show i'm so glad that you're here i'm adima zolkari innovation value creation expert and i'll be your host and i have a very very special guest and friend hello katrine hello adi how are you doing and congratulations yes i'm so happy so thank you thank you for being here katrine schundorf is a certified high performance coach and the ex CEO of Mercer and a PhD student. Wow, I'm so happy to have Kathleen here. And, and I want to tell you that other than the fact that I really appreciate her and, and she's like a guide for me, uh, she's a friend and I really, really love the fact that we're going to have a Thank fun you. talk together. Thank you. And I mean, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> me too. And we're live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. And you're so invited to join the discussion and ask questions. And now we can start. It seems that all companies need to innovate. What is the biggest obstacle to innovation as you see it? I think that every one of us has or might have a different understanding of innovation. And I think that this is one of the biggest obstacles, uh, and myself included. And let me tell you, from uh, where I was um, and where I'm today with innovation, um, I recall when I stepped down uh, from my CEO position at Mercer, um, I spoke with, I handed over some, some, some tasks um, uh, to my successor, and we were talking, and I told him, you know, and please make sure that you continue to innovate our services, meaning see how you can squeeze it in. And <laughs> now that I understand a little bit more about innovation, also talking to you and, and, some, and with some other experts, um, today I have changed my, the way I'm talking about innovation because I'm talking now about a process which makes sure to run the ideation, the testing, the validation uh, of ideas in an efficient way. And now you have my attention as a leader because it's not the word innovation which triggers my attention, other two words, process and efficiency. Because now I'm starting to think, okay, what does it mean? So the what? How will it happen? The how and where shall I do that? And this changes and it brings a little bit, it triggers the right question to bring clarity on the table. So as soon as you, you go out from the expert word, you can, you can lower down the temperature and bring more clarity. So when, when you're saying process, it means that you need a structured way of doing it and then you could really execute and without it, it's like blurry? Well, I would, I would say that depending on, on where it is, I, I think that, for instance, if you're working in a software company, um, you do have, you know, innovation and production of coding runs in the same way. But me, for instance, from a consulting um, background, it is. It means something different. And I had, you know, I always thought about innovation. Yeah, to create a new thing, but it's if you want to really have something sustainable, which really helps a company. I don't think that you can do innovation so just on the side <laughs> and just squeeze yeah. it in. And do you think that leaders really understand this importance or they have so much on their head right now that they can't really understand it or do the same thing? I would say if, if I'm looking back at, at my days, you know, usually there were between 13 to 16 hours. You have so many things running and just to know that you need to have an, you need to bring in innovation, you tend to, 
okay, think about that, or maybe talk with uh, with your management team, and uh, and you hand it over. But it then starts to sit somewhere in the organization. No one really feels um, responsible for it, or doesn't get the right attention, and it means you don't put something a process which um, automates, you know. Uh, the the entire the entire innovation uh, idea, and then everyone can put different meaning on it. So, I found out that if you talk about process and efficiency, you definitely have you you catch the attention of the leaders, and then the leaders are thinking automatically um, themselves. You know the right questions. Right. Right. And do you think it's related to to culture because you've been like in a big german German corporate or not? <clears throat> well, Mercer runs uh, internationally, and i was I was working in Germany and also in Switzerland. Um, no, I think it has to do um, I think it's more about the word itself. Uh, and the meaning that every one of us puts behind it. Because yesterday, you know, I was looking in, um, in a French dictionary because originally I'm French. And whenever you look for the origins of the word, you go to the litre. And I found a, um, a quote from 1197, which was pretty, pretty revealing to me. And I'm, now I'm going to translate it in English. Um, it, was, it, it was said there, The desire and lust to innovate, um, change, and stir everything. So it has kind of a muddy connotation, you know, and if you look also at the history, whenever it was um, about um, state, um, laws, and language, I mean, some centuries before, innovation was not... Was not really permitted, so I, I don't know with what we have. You know, I mean, as an understanding, it might be also. I I don't think that it is necessarily a cultural thing. It is that it is presented too much as an innovation, as something new, and a leader then s- tells himself or herself, "Okay, how can I squeeze that in?" But it is not. putting the right focus at the, at the right place. So if you change it in a process and efficiency, you're getting at least the attention of the leader and then you can start talking. I mean, this is what I've noticed uh, when also thinking about, you know, reflecting of what I could have done better now with everything I know today. Um, and also when talking with peers and, and other CEOs, I, I would definitely turn it into more into a process. So when you're talking to these other CEOs, what is your like, this is the mistake you need to think about. Or this is something you should attend to. What do you tell them? I don't, I don't talk about mistakes. I think it is, I think it is a lack of clarity. Um, And if we talk now about innovation per se, um, you know, I, I think that um, leaders know that innovation is required, a certain level of innovation to continue to run the business, you know, to be attractive to uh, in the marketplace. They know that. But interestingly, I, and I think it was before COVID, um, I don't know if it was a, an Accenture study, um, they found out that only 6% of, um, of C-suite um, executives We're happy with the innovation efforts uh, in-house. And it shows that they know, I mean, they know that it is not, it is not working. But it is a big, you know, it's like a Pandora box. So yeah. if you just come with the innovation topic, it kind of, yeah, I mean, you know, I have the other things that I need to be looking at and it gets forgotten. 
And um, so I would really, really put clarity around the topic and what it requires. Would it be from a financing perspective, from the skills that you need, you know, and and also the metrics because they're different. And um, so the more you bring clarity on around on how you can embed innovation per se into your organizational structure, the better it will be. I don't think it has necessarily to do with, with a culture thing. Today, everyone knows that <laughs> you better do something, you know, on renewing, refreshing, um, bringing new services, new products, else you will be, I mean, swept out of the marketplace very quickly. Yeah. You, do you think it's changed due to COVID? Will everything change so fast or not? Maybe they went to the other side saying like, let's freeze for a minute and see what's going on. Well, I think that this is a, um, I've heard it also from, from people to, uh, that I know from, from the banking um, area and where they are lending money to, uh, to corporations or to existing companies. I know or I can think or I think to know from where it comes from. Um, because, I mean, COVID has, for, for most of the companies, I mean, it has been a burden. And how do you get out of, 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 this, uh, uh, of this crisis and, and start again? And um, so the, the first reflexes are, okay, so let's freeze everything, which is not, you know, day-to-day uh, -day operations. And, um, and most of the time it comes from the finances and they're saying, okay, freeze the hirings, but you cannot freeze an innovation process, um, an innovation structure, because with the innovation, you are out on the market, you, you're out with your partners, with your teams. So if you stop, if you freeze that, you cannot start it again because you, your reputation will be, you know, you will have lost some credibility. So uh, I think it is not a good thing to, to stop it. I think it would be better than to look at the daily operations where you can here do some sacrifices so that you can continue with the innovation because at the end it also contributes to the longevity of, of, your, of your business. And how do you think that when a leader thinks about the short run and the long run, you know, they have the quarterly rev uh, review and they need to take care about the revenues right now and they need to think about what would be two or maybe three years from now and it's sometimes contradicting. So how do they do this like two um, different opposite sides? I, I think, you know, if if I got gray hair, <laughs> it's because of this, you know, I mean, it's like, a, <laughs> it's a game. I mean, <laughs> it's something which is not comfortable, a comfortable place to be at on the other side. Um, you know, it has to do with, with growth, sustainable growth. So, um, and for me, sustainable growth is around without increasing now, you know, um, financials, um, uh, um, uh, looking at uh, how to get some, some additional financing. It is about to build it around client centricity. And for me, I mean, you cannot build client centricity if you're not, if you're only thinking about your customer, your client experience journey. It's also about thinking ahead. It's also about anticipating what, what will come, you know, what will happen in the marketplace. And especially nowadays, you know, you do not know where all suddenly you might face a new competitor or someone, a partner with whom you could um, link up and work together. You, you don't know it. So I think that three to five year strategies are becoming more or less obsolete. I mean, it's good to have them to know in which directions you're heading. 
but you need to revise them constantly. I mean, I would even say in a, in a rhythm of six months, the least, just to see what is going on, you know, in, in the marketplace, to know, I mean, to really work on what is called the leading indicators. And, um, and if I may tell a personal story for that, yeah. um, my, my father has been a pilot and or was a pilot. And um, in the 70s, milit the military and the commercial flight space was the same. And the, the fact of anticipating was something which was which saved my father's life many times, especially when flying in clouds. And he was always, you know, looking around if he could spot a shadow, because then he knew oh, there might be, you know, another plane coming, you know, uh, hitting or flying towards you. So it was about steering, you know, the, the plane to the other direction. Um, good for him. Both sides <laughs> had the <laughs> yeah, right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I grew up in this, um, <laughs> I grew up in this mantra of anticipation. And I recall my father telling me already as a child, Gati anticipate. When I was driving, Gati anticipate. And it gave me the reflex of, you know, um, anticipating everything. And it's kind of fatigue. I mean, it, it is exhausting, but you have... You know, you have your antennas and your ears, which are um, um, which need to be open all the time to know what it what is happening. And my background, I have been always called um, to either bring out companies out of a mess um, or a messy situation. And you know, the when you step in. In, in such a mandate or in a, in a company um, who ha who, which is in a decade place, you look at the current indicators, the past indicators, you know, the lagging ones, but they're giving you some, they're giving you some hints about why, why they're in, in, in a not, in not so good place. But the first thing you need really to look at are the leading indicators because they are giving you the opportunity to steer out like the plane you know to steer the company or the business you know instead of uh, flying downwards or falling but to steer it in another direction and and i think that with regard to that um strategy and short-term thinking need to be aligned all the time and you need to correct them nowadays long answer yeah. to a short question <laughs> I, I love the story about your father and flying in the clouds and to remind me of my father he was a military person for a few like half of his career i know maybe less and he always told me you know be careful you know when when i opened the closet in the in the kitchen he said it could hurt your eye or something he always mm -hmm. was very anxious about that so it reminds me that we always like all the kids are laughing like yeah it will hurt your eye when you open a closet <laughs> So but funny. they are, I'm, I'm, I mean, our parents in a certain way, I mean, um, I, I must say I'm very grateful to my father and I know it. I mean, I mean, having seen him, I, I think the, the, uh, the incident which made him really where he came at home with straight hair on his head, which I've never seen uh, before with him when um, the tower, it, it was, I think, in Madrid made an error and place two arriving planes at the same point, only the alt altitudes were different. And so the tower was only seeing one point and they really hit in the air with uh, them, their, uh, their plane with a seven, uh, 747. And for God's sake, I mean, they had, the pilots had the right, you know, reactions. My father was underneath and had still, you know, the ability to, steer down and, and to land safely. But, you know, I, I think that with this in the background, you never know where the danger, the danger opportunities will come from. And this is also the beauty because when you, 
when you work around client centricity, um, it is as a leader, it is for you the ability also to test how how far you can stretch your um, your products and services, your the skills in in your company, but also the structure of the company. Do you, if you want to be really client centric? Can you continue to operate as you are today, or do you need to adapt something? And 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 this is where I think leaders, even though getting gray hair, <laughs> it comes <laughs> with the you know with the responsibility. It has a very much an entrepreneurial thinking, and you need to 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 um, to act quickly, and therefore clarity in everything. Uh, you do is really important and also always to trigger the right button with a leader because then they start thinking, you know, it's like an automatism which pops out. And um, mm -hmm. and then where you can then start having the discussions on how you can do it. Right, right. So I want to talk to you about being a successful woman in a corporate. So let's say that a young woman comes to you and talks to you about her career and what would you teach her about business about what she has to know when she starts her way there mm -hmm. um i love doing that and and some some of my clients are even former employees of mine um and some others are you know um coming back and and i as working with me as a coach and I have even um, on a regular basis I have even one former um, employee of mine who still comes back to me I mean recently 15 years after so it is beautiful to see that there is a trust relationship and and where they really talk to me very openly and and where we are walking um, uh, we're walking through the topics which are relevant to them. Um, but what I would say, especially with women, is um, know your value, claim it, um, and just be bold to ask your seat at the decision table. And I'm currently working on an online course uh, that I want to offer to to women because it really saddens me when I hear accomplished women who have managerial roles still waiting for someone in the organization to recognize their value. And I think that this is, um, you know, and it happened also to me, dedication is good, but it will lead you nowhere when it comes to a career. Um, and if you, if you as a woman, you do not have the, the perspective of building and constructing your career, and you only be being dedicated, even with great work that you're doing and producing, also maybe together with your teams, despite the result, your, your efforts will be considered as a job, and a job always is a commodity. So... Whenever you can, break out of the job thing, build your career, because then it will allow others, and especially leaders, to see, I mean, what is the value that you're bringing. And then, you know, and some men, lovely men, colleagues who are passing you by, you know, left and right, and and getting promoted, and you sitting still, you know, on the side of, of the road. Well, I mean, young women and also older ones, just do something about it because there are tactics and strategies, you know, to avoid this frustration. Yeah, I, I love what you said about them waiting for an approval from the outside, someone who is like telling them, yeah, you, you, are, you need to take this role instead of claiming yes. it. Because I think that women are very aimed of being a pleaser sometimes and, and yes. being very tuned to what other things people say or what they decide or what like really giving them the credits and sometimes oh, you know you just need to understand that 
it's like they're they're really good leaders and they're doing their job but you're not less of of a of, a, of, of an option that they are they 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 are human they're doing mistakes and you you could claim your own um right to do these mistakes as well nobody's perfect right when they take him in a jerial or a sea level um position it's not like yeah they're like the perfect person and now you need to be one like that right oh i don't i don't hear you kathleen something about the something about the the um, internet is not working let's let's wait for for a few minutes i hope that she comes back let's see i'll do that so i i want to tell you a, sto- a small story about katherine until she comes back Um, I, I, I don't know how I, I met Katrine and, and we started talking and it was like, wow. Like I, I, the first time I saw her, I said like, she's, she's really cool and she understands what she's saying and she's so open and it's like, yeah, she's really interesting. I didn't really thought that this is what she's doing. So after I talked to her and um, I went to her LinkedIn and. And I found out that she was the CEO of Mercer, which is a really big corporate. And I said, like, that's not how I imagine um, this, this kind of, a, of a, like a leader or a CEO. And, and I really appreciate, oh, I see she's back. And I really appreciate her work and, and what she's been doing. So I really love her, what she's saying. <laughs> hey, so we're back. He, uh- On my cell phone because I think we do have a uh, street work being done outside mm. and I don't know if they did something with the uh, uh, can you hear me yeah I can hear you yes excellent so sure. so I see you like the video is a bit stuck but I hear you well could okay. you go back To the computer or we, um, we could st- I don't know let me see and I'm sorry to please. to um, to do no, that just fine please <laughs> um, just fine things happen you know okay so I sure. should be let me let me leave here sure sure let's see yeah yeah I do you hear me now I don't hear you <laughs> it's not working it's always the technology that comes in the middle right <laughs> okay I hope that the podcast listener will be like patient with me in that time at least but we'll continue really shortly so um it's a great way to, to just to Should see be that working now yeah Yeah, like yes. in real life, this is what's really happening yes. usually, <laughs> for sure. I just told them that, you know, that after that we talked the first time, I went to your LinkedIn and I was like, wow, she's like really a serious person. And, and I was surprised. Wow, CEO of Mercer. And now oh, Mercer is a big per- company. Like, wow. Right. And, and for me, it was surprising the way that you are like so upfront and, and sincere and human and, and fun. And funny <laughs> because well, when you, you imagine you know the CEO of a, of a company it's like different well I I think that <laughs> that is interesting that you're saying that I, I think that um, um, first the I must say the colleagues at Mercer and and also I'm also talking about the other CEOs because I mean for for Either every region or country you had different CEOs um, the the working relationship with our global CEO the former one Julio Porta Latin or now Martin Furland uh, has been always uh, a joy uh, you know and uh, we were all very c- closely working together so the human side has always prevailed and um, Uh, and I must say that is really 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 excellent the the only thing which makes me maybe a little bit different is that um, some of the sometimes 
um, especially I mean, men as well as women, when you step into such a role, especially in a l very large international corporation, because you know of the liability which um, is, is there also you as a CEO um, and from a governance and, and compliance perspective, you become kind of, you know, prudent in what you're saying. And uh, But I never, I am very, I mean, I was really looking at what I was saying, but I want to have fun and joy. And, uh, and I want to have that also with the people I'm working with. And so I think that I remained in a certain way, you know, kind of people were wondering in Switzerland, is she smiling all the time? And I heard that from uh, one of my team members reporting that to me. Is that real? <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you know, laughing and I was thinking, Jesus, I mean, if, if you need to be serious to be all the time, you know, to, <laughs> to be efficient, you know, I, I think I have enough credentials and also my results. Um, uh, I know what I can do, what I have delivered so far. And, you know, so I don't have to prove an, anything. So, I mean, I, I just allow myself to be who I am. Yeah. yeah. But when you don't have the credentials yet... It's kind of hard. It, it might be hard on the other side. We women, we are so, and I, I'm talking now specifically about women. I don't say that men aren't that. But, um, you know, when we talk now about women, women, and, and that is fascinating because Mercer has since many years um a study, a global study that they're doing with the, I mean, with the clients, um, and it's called "When Women Thrive, Businesses Thrive," and it is kind of um, of interesting. We know exactly where we're losing in the companies, the women. We exactly know what needs to be done, and still, you know, we are losing the women. We are losing them, and so it is. Um, and we know that all of them are very are very dedicated to their job. But we are mostly, you know, if you're looking at the, the constitution of the, or the network of a woman compared to the one of a man in general, women tend to have peers within the organization with whom they are having reports and this sharing and discussing what could be, you know, leverage, what could be done here. When men have a more opportunistic way and in a positive way, you know, opportunistic way, they, they look more outside and outside of the company so that whenever they have a question, they can, they know where to get some also outside information. When we want, you know, that the harmony, you know, with the family, and often the work is also an extension of the family. And I, I think that you can keep that spirit because it's really important because it's often, I mean, women have a different leadership style than men, and please continue to do that. Um, because it's what, what is the glue often within a company, what makes it, you know, that it is warm hearted, uh, that people feel well. I mean, not only internally, but also with clients. Um, the only thing is you need to, to think about, or you need to know how you need to, or you should react if all of a sudden, let's say during a meeting, you're exposing, or uh, not exposing, but you're explaining your idea and everything says yes. And then you have a colleague, usually a male colleague, you know, taking on your idea, boldly sharing it as if it was his and getting then the credit for it. Sure. And and these are the things, you know, you, there are tactics on how to make sure that you're just nailing <laughs> you know, your colleague so that you can continue to carry the credit and get, you know, get full with it. So yeah. this is where, I, I mean, with credential or not, you, you um, and, and women know nowadays, uh, they know very well how to build uh, credential in a fast way.
They usually do. So, so where do we miss them? Where do we lose these women? Why don't we have more of them? We lose them mostly in the mid-management level, either because of what I just said, the frustration, you know, that they're not being heard or being recognized and not knowing how to, to do it. And, and I have been myself in such a position for many years. Um, therefore, I'm really also grateful that uh, with Mercer, you know, I claimed I, I came to Mercer and I was pretty frustrated, you know, because I cleaned up a situation there and I didn't get to, to the partner level. And I remember that uh, Martin Furland, one day uh, we were talking about um, uh, young men asking, uh, young colleagues asking to become partners. And I was saying to her, you know, I mean, that's a little bit bold. And <laughs> she laughed and she told me, I mean, Catherine, I must correct you. The first time you and I, we spoke, you said to me, I want to become a partner. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, 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 both, um, we both laughed, but it shows exactly, I mean, where, um, where we are losing most, most women. It's about being bold, about asking what they want. It's also about the responsibility of a leader. And Julio, Julio Portalatin has been fantastic for that. I recall him when coming over to Germany and speaking to the Dach region, meaning Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. And we were all, uh, all the leaders sitting in, in the room. He said, okay, how many women do you want to hire in, um, in the leadership team? Well, we're looking, you know, to, we have certain candidates. So how many women do you want to hire? <laughs> Well, we need to see, I mean, you know, I mean, there are men candidates. And he said, he, he turned around, you know, he looked at every one of us and he said, it is your responsibility to bring at least two to three women every year to the table, decision table. And I don't want to hear if it's okay, yes or no. If you have difficulties to find them, you have to find them and you have to make it happen. And I must say, I have uh, the utmost respect um, for this person, for this man, because he has been also the one, you know, bringing and helping and supporting Martine to be where she is today. And uh, so, and, you know, I think also, and Martine Furland always says this, um, I think that she has three kids and when she had a pretty uh, interesting role and, and consulting responsibility at, at Willis Towers Watson at that time, um, <clears throat> oh, it, I think it was uh, Watson Towers um, early back then, she went on maternity leave and it was her boss who called her back and said, no, you're coming back. So we are losing also women because then they are going into maternity leave want to be there for uh, for the kids and the employers are not doing enough to really like with this former boss of Martin Furland to call them back to say no I mean you have your kids yes but it doesn't doesn't matter we need you we want you if your mother of small kids or not will help you and I think that this is something I I've done all my time uh, even though I personally, I, I mean, myself, I don't have kids. I think it is really important um, to help women also in part-time jobs um, and as well as giving um, the ability to women working in part-time, also to giving them the ability to uh, become managers and leaders. And this is maybe, if I have a regret I have been too conservative um, back then uh, with regard to that. Yeah, I totally understand. Because we need to understand what is really preventing them from doing that step. And yes. sometimes it's something so practical. Sometimes, you know, like in Israel, we have lots of traffic. And the fact that all the centers are in Tel Aviv, and most people don't have the ability to live in Tel Aviv, 
So the traffic is like two or three hours a day, just moving from one place to the other and being more flexible or doing something online and partly in the office or having more spreaded offices or something just to understand what is really bothering these women. And and they're very talented and smart. Mm -hmm. And if the the corporate is proactive and they, they need to do something because, you know, just blaming the women for not being would not taking their part is just half of the equation because the men which are currently leading these companies need to take responsibility too and yes. they want a different world for their wives and their daughters and and they want to get there and if it's like it's proven that it's good for business there is no other way to do it well it it is it is proven and uh, you know Forbes just published yesterday their series of 50 over 50, uh, 50 so women who have created either um, corporations um, uh, are in politics and are successful with over being over 50s and I think that and I'm also over 50 I think that it is so um, we ought the younger generation to show them, yes, it can be done. And we are there to help you. We are there to support you. But you mentioned something which is really important. If there is one advice I can give to any woman, if a a company doesn't accept you being a mother and working part-time, and especially now still in COVID, but now slowly going, you know, after the COVID time, we will be looking anyway as as employers um, to the work uh, or the way of working. And mostly it will go towards two to three days at work and two from home. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the way we, we have approached working or the physical presence at the office will change dramatically now. I mean, as soon as we are going to step back into an, um, some kind of new normalcy. Um, and uh, But a, a company which doesn't respect you as, as a young mother and doesn't facilitate you, I mean, especially leaders who don't, do not support you, please just, just move on. I mean, don't stay there. You will never get anything from them. Yeah, I totally understand what you're saying because, like, it needs to. You, you need to understand that you have the right to do it. It's not like they are doing me a favor. It's like, no, you're so important and you're contributing and you have some. You you're bringing value to the company. Mm-hmm. So right. It, they're right. not doing any favor. Yes. They need to do it. If they want to yes. be successful, they need to do it. And and fight. I mean, I mean, fight and demand it. You can do it in a charming way, in a smiling way, and very collaborative way. But let the other know. You know, because it's an energy thing. If you are always retracted and you're waiting for the recognition or the permission to do that, it means that you're leaving the space for others to bring you along where they want. And, and, I'm, and I'm having here, um, I'm using often the, um, a picture for that. I'm, I, I used to ask, um, or still I still do that, is I'm asking people, are you sitting in the passenger seat or in the driver's seat of your life or your career? Because, you know, it happens that, you know, we're driving and all of a sudden, boom, I'm, who I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the passenger seat because, and then you, you just switch over again because whenever the driver's seat is being occupied by someone else, they will drive you where they want to go. So, I mean, there, there is, this is a law. I mean, um, you cannot change it. So you, I mean, your obligation and, and your awareness is, you know, always to look at, okay, if, am I, where am I sitting, driver or passenger? And yeah. uh, this is, yeah. That's a great tip for life in general, just taking what you want. You, you want to get somewhere, just go there. You don't yes. wait for anyone else to do it mm-hmm. for you. So I want to thank you for your time. It's, it's been such a pleasure talking to you and, you and always fun talking to you. So thank you. Thank where, you so much. Where could people find you? I'll, I'll do this so people would like have the ability to 
And I would then... say, I mean, the easiest thing is go on LinkedIn. Uh, you find them, my phone number, cell, uh, cell phone number on the information. Uh, you can uh, send me an email or you do have also here my, my uh, email address. You, you find everything on LinkedIn. So, um, and it's also the place where I have most of the exchanges anyway. Yeah. So it's been always like, it's always fun. And I want to thank you for coming. Thank you and for having me. And to all of you change makers out there, thank you for joining me. And if you want to learn more about my work, you could visit invincibleinnovation.com. And I'll see you next week with another insightful, innovative talk. See ya. See you. Bye-bye. I'm Adima Zaukario, and you've been listening to the Invincible Innovation Podcast. Make sure to visit our website, invincibleinnovation.com, where you can learn more about our programs and my book, Innovating Through Chaos. I'll be waiting for you next week in our next episode. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.